Welcome to Conversations with Dr. Skip Mason. Pastor, preacher, historian, author, teacher, librarian, archivist, world traveler, collector, family historian, avid reader, and creator of the popular Vanishing Black Atlanta Facebook page. But a lot of folks who love history. Most, Most importantly, he's our, he's our dad, who loves his family, and who taught us the importance of our history and having important conversations. Join him now for this episode of Conversations with Dr. Skip. Well, good Sunday afternoon, my brothers and sisters. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am so delighted to be back with you again uh, for this very special conversation uh, this afternoon uh, as we reminisce and look back uh, over the last 40 years, uh, remembering the dynamic class of 1982. Some of you were at the General Conference when Bishop Marshall Gilmore, Bishop William Graves, Bishop Dotsie Isom, Bishop Otho Lakey, and Bishop Ori Broomfield were elected uh, and consecrated to serve in 1982 in Memphis. And so today I'll sit with uh, Bishop Gilmore uh, and Bishop Lakey uh, as they reflect on that time uh, and as they uh, reminisce not only about uh, the period of their uh, seeking to be elected, but since that time as well. Let me greet our senior Bishop Lawrence Reddick and Mrs. Wendy Jones Reddick, the College of Bishops under the leadership of Bishop Sylvester Williams uh, and Mrs. Carmen Leonard Williams. Uh, let me greet the chairs of the uh, CIT committee, Bishop uh, James B. Walker, uh, and my bishop, Bishop Thomas Lewis Brown, uh, and Dr. Louise Baker Brown, uh, and our general secretary of uh, CIT, uh, Mrs. Teresa Duhart, Dr. Teresa Duhart, excuse me, uh, who continues to provide stellar leadership. And I'm excited that Dr. Duhart uh, has an upcoming CTI chat talk on Saturday, August the 27th from one to 2.30, and it has a distinguished array of panelists who will be sharing uh, and engaging uh, in a conversation uh, and providing some support and assistance to you as we continue to maneuver uh, and manage uh, through a technology in this period of what we call the post pandemic. Let me also recognize the ladies of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority, uh, when I did my recap of the general conference uh, just a little over a month ago, I did not have a photo, but thank you, uh, Sister Teresa Muldrow for sending and for sharing uh, that particular image. Um, we were at the general conference on the day of the election and a beautiful letter was read by Bishop Reddick uh, on behalf of Bishop Marshall Gilmore. And not only was the letter read, we were also blessed to, to hear a, a prayer. I'm just going to play a little of the audio. The screen will be black for just a moment, uh, but you'll hear just a little bit of the audio of the prayer that we heard. Well, without a doubt, uh, those of you who were there know that that prayer shifted the atmosphere. And I am so blessed that uh, that prayer uh, has been shared. It blessed me so that I reached out to Sister uh, Joan Gilmore Oglesby and uh, just inquired what her dad would do with the prayer. He she said, oh, he probably throw it in the trash. Uh, I said, please, if he considers, would he send the prayer to me? And so I received the handwritten 
manuscript of that majestic prayer from Bishop uh, Gilmore. Uh, and it is something uh, that I will forever, forever treasure. I'm looking for it now, I'll probably put it back in the vault in my safe because I don't want to uh, lose it. But I'm so grateful to have that uh, prayer, and it blessed us tremendously. A couple of days ago, uh, on Friday to be exact, I sat down uh, with Bishop uh, Lakey and Bishop Gilmore. Uh, in advance of today's show, which is being pre-recorded. It is pre-recorded. Uh, and so I want you to listen and enjoy this great conversation with these two great iconic Episcopal leaders, the 41st and the 44th uh, Bishop of, of our church, uh, two uh, men uh, that we love and absolutely uh, adore. Uh, and so I encourage you today to enjoy this conversation uh, with uh, Bishop Lakey and Bishop Gilmore, the class of 1982. Well, what a joy and an honor and a privilege, really, uh, it is to sit with the 41st and 44th Bishop of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, Bishop Marshall Gilmore and Bishop Otho Lakey. Uh, we're going to spend some time today, hopefully more so my listening, uh, as they talk about 40 years ago, actually 40 plus years ago, uh, and, and their role to being elected uh, an Episcopal uh, leader, a bishop in the class of 1882. Bishop Lakey and Bishop Gilmore, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. I'm so delighted to have both of you here with uh, me. And before we begin, let me offer my regards to uh, Mrs. Yvonne Gilmore uh, and Dr. Uh, Elfrida Lakey uh, as well. And let me thank my dear friend and sister uh, uh, Joan uh, for her technical assistance uh, and for making sure that Bishop Gilmore is on and creating that wonderful backdrop. But there's a there's a bat story to that backdrop, but we won't discuss. <laughs> we won't discuss that. But but before we begin, uh, Bishop Lakey, you were called out of retirement, uh, if you will, as if you were ever really retired, because you're always writing. And your wife tells me, my member, your wife tells me, you stay up late uh, at night. But you were called out of retirement to uh, go back to your home district, the Fourth Episcopal District, to assist Bishop C. James King. T tell us about that experience, if you would. I'd like to start there. Well, it was an, uh, an exciting experience, really. Uh, Bishop Gilmore's, he'd been called out of retirement a couple of times, and this was my only experience. And it was really a, a new experience because I'd been retired for uh, 11, uh, uh, 11 years. And so uh, it, it was almost getting uh, back on the bicycle again after a, a long time not doing it, trying to steer the wheels and all. And it was an exciting experience. And then to go back to Louisiana, uh, Mississippi and Louisiana, uh, as you know, I pastored in Louisiana uh, for three years and in the Narciss, uh, my first wife was born in Mississippi. So it was a it was like going back home, but I had never, uh, I had never been the bishop there. And as the, as the saying goes, though, the foundations that really were still in place were laid by Bishop Marshall Gilmore for the fourth district was his uh, initial Episcopal assignment. So I had a lot of reminiscing as people would often call his name, say Bishop Gilmore, ordained me and Bishop Gilmore appointed me. So it was a wonderful experience. And, and also I had an opportunity then to come to the general conference, uh, more or less in charge of a delegation, which was a new experience also. So I thoroughly enjoyed being back in the harness for a while to see the church uh, anew from a retired point of view and really to see how much uh, the church has changed, while at the same time, seeing how much it had remained the same. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. And, and Bishop Gilmore, Bishop Lakey referenced your having been called out of retirement. 
uh, a couple of times. So what do you feel when you, you think you're about to sail on and enjoy the sunset and the church calls you back? uh into active duty bishop gilmore what what is that like for you or what was it like for you well the first time i was called out i was asked to go back to the district from which i was elected and which i served under bishop lakey <laughs> <laughs> see i went back to dayton for i think a month after i election 82 and served philip temple church for the for that month and he was my bishop and it was just good getting back and seeing the people i was that time i was only there for i think well five months and uh, it was a good experience the last time was the seventh district which is my home district um uh, i never passed in this district when we were seniors in seminary bishop bell who was w y bell was my bishop and he contacted me and told me, he said, now, your presiding elder wants you to preach and teach, but I don't want you to do that. And I don't have an appointment that I think will uh, provide you the income that would allow you only to pastor. So I'm going to go to Knoxville, Tennessee. That was in January of 1961 for the College of Bishops meeting. And I will find you a bishop. And he did. And he notified me later that Bishop J. Claude Allen would provide for me in Chicago. Bishop Blakey was called by Bishop Allen because I didn't know Bishop Allen. Bishop Blakey knew him, but I did not know him. And Bishop Bell made it possible for me to uh, not come back and have to teach and, and preach. But it was a good experience. But what I'm what I found out then, well, that was uh eight years after I had retired. And it was different because I knew, really, I knew nothing about this district, knew nothing about the preachers. But they were all very kind and accepting. And uh, I tried to carry out Bishop Hort's uh, program for that time. Well, Bishop, we uh, thank both of you for your tremendous service to the church. We have just returned from a general conference uh, quite an exhilarating uh, general conference, uh, to say the least. So many uh, moments, experiences, and highlights. Uh, the word on the street is that if you want a, a bishop to close out the last session of the general conference, you call on Bishop Othel Hawthorne Lakey, uh, and you'll get it done in, in record time. Uh, one of the highlights, uh, I think, for me personally, of the general conference, there were two. Uh, among many, was a letter that Bishop Reddick read uh, to the General Conference from you, Bishop Gilmore. Uh, and I have the letter, um, a copy of it, uh, and signed by you. And I just want to share a couple of things in the letter. You said, uh, as you greeted Bishop Reddick, you said that you're 91 years of age and you attended your first General Conference in 1962 as a visitor at Lane Tabernacle CME, St. Louis, Missouri. The Reverend Othel H. Lakey traveled with me back to Chicago and preached at Great Temple where I was privileged to pastor. Bishop Lakey was visibly moved by that statement. I, I saw it, I witnessed it, I looked at him as the letter was being, uh, being read. Uh, and, and then you went on to say uh, that on the day the conference closed, the Lord says the same, Yvonne and I will celebrate our 64th wedding anniversary. Well, that was a beautiful moment uh, for the conference. But on the day of the election of bishops, uh, unbeknownst to, I guess, the delegation, maybe the College of Bishops may have known, uh, you dialed in and they arranged for you to offer uh, a prayer uh, to the general conference. Uh, and I will say this, um, and I'll stand by it, that that prayer that you shared shifted the atmosphere uh, of the conference. Uh, it was so beautiful, you could hear a pin drop in, in the room. Uh, and I am so honored and blessed to hold the actual manuscript uh, of that prayer uh, that Bishop Gilmore sent me thank you joan i appreciate you sent me 
and so Bishop, tell us, Bishop Gilmore, tell us about this prayer. Uh, were you asked to offer the prayer? Uh, and just kind of give us a little bit about the inspiration for the words that you pen on paper that I am so blessed to hold in my hands. Yes, I was asked by the senior bishop. He called me and asked me if I would offer the prayer. And I remember that traditionally, someone has been chosen to pray before the election of bishops. And I've been a bishop long enough to get some perspectives on how I feel about the office. And uh, when I was trying to draft the prayer, I thought of the history of our church and also the atmosphere of a general conference when you're gonna have an election. So I wanted to really uh, tap into both. And I tried to remember some of the bishops I've served under because when I was in Dayton, I served under, I think four or five bishops during the time, it was eight, 18 years I served there. And I was under quite a number of bishops for different reasons because they were sent to other areas. And so I really wanted to Try to, if I can use the word spiritualize the prayer more than anything else. It's been amazing how many people have called me and sent me texts about the prayer. Bishop Blake and I discussed it after the general conference. Just as you mentioned about him closing out, we discussed that that day because I thought about how Bishop Johnson closed out the general conference in 1974 in Philadelphia. And somebody asked if there was a quorum. I remember what Bishop Johnson ruled that morning. He said, we began with one, and so that's sufficient for us to end with one. He didn't answer the question about whether it was supposed or not. He just ruled that because we started with a quorum, that was sufficient for the entire general conference. Nobody questioned it. And they passed the budget that Sunday morning. So it was very interesting. I uh, have some feelings about this time in my life in the church. And uh, I wanted to make the prayer as meaningful as I could because of that. Because as I always tell people, I have less time left than I have lived. And so I don't, I don't even worry about that, but I try to uh, just do the best I can at this point in my life. Well, well, Bishop Gilmore, thank you. Thank you so you much may, for this. May I, may I comment on that? Uh, but, yes, yes, please, Bishop Lakey. Uh, sitting there on, on the platform as we were preparing to elect bishops, uh, I was concerned that there didn't seem to be at that moment, at that time, the, the spirituality that I thought should obtain when we were going into the important task of electing the next leaders of the church and when bishop gilmore offered his prayer as you rightly said dr mason um the entire atmosphere of the general conference changed and for for me it became what we really ought to mean when we say general conference electing bishops it was at that moment i think that we shifted from a political uh, organization to a spiritual community. And I really felt the presence of God among us after Bishop Gilmore offered his most meaningful prayer. Uh, when we say prayer changes things, I think this was evidence that it, this was one prayer that changed something. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And, and speaking of changing things, let's go back now to 1982. Well, I don't know whether we need to go back to 1978. I'm gonna let y'all determine that uh, between 78 and 82, there were a number of things going on in the church, uh, the deaths of a number of bishops. Uh, and as I've read in your history book a number of times, Bishop, uh, there was this need to establish a call, a call general conference. I'm gonna let you you, you give the correct understanding uh, of that uh, and how it came to be. There was some legal jargon, some, some petitions made, et cetera, all to get us to a general conference so that you all could be uh, elected. 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, of course, Bishop Gilmore, I believe that you were an aspirant for Bishop in, in 78. Uh, and so I think, according to the author of the history of the CME Church, you were you were you were highly favored uh, for this next go round. But both of you, just 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 sort of take us back between seventy eight and eighty two, in anticipation of getting ready for this general conference. You were the editor, uh, of course, uh, of the Christian uh, Index. Uh, and Bishop Gilmore, you were passing. So would you just kind of give us your recollections of that period? Either one of you can jump in. Well, I, I like for Bishop Gilmore to, to go first because he was living through it. And, and I was later on writing about it. I'd like to hear how he felt about it before I come in. Well, going up to the 78 Young Conference, my support really was coming from two sources I understood it because what the third source asked me to drive him from the hotel in Cincinnati to the airport <clears throat> and bring nobody with you. <laughs> so I, I drove the bishop <clears throat> to the airport and he was to retire to St. Major Young Conference and he reminded me that he was going to seek to be recalled. So I figured at that point, my support from him was going to be minimal at best. But Bishop Johnson and Bishop Curry were supporting me at the time. And uh, I also had a situation at home. <laughs> the daughter who've been helping you, Joan, told me that if you get elected, I ain't moving. <laughs> so, <laughs> Here I am with my young daughter, says she's going to stay in Dayton and finish high school. I, I felt pretty good going to that general conference. My presiding elder had assured me that I wouldn't get elected in that general conference, and I didn't. But I felt pretty good going in. You know, I've never run against other candidates. I was seeking the office. And I was going to do what I could to, uh, to to achieve it. So I felt good. I think my own bishop at the time, when Bishop Cummins came that time, but Bishop Shire was my bishop going up to that general conference. But he was doing the best he could as a retired bishop. And there was several candidates from my district. So. Uh, I decided to just do the best I could in making it uh, into the Episcopacy. And I felt okay. I tell you the truth, after the general conference was over, some members of Philip Triple came to me and said, we're glad you didn't get elected. And one of them told me, he said, you know, so we owe, I think my $20,000 on the church that we built. And he said, you've already raised the money and it's here. But if you leave, some preacher's going to come and pay that money off with money you've written, note off with money you've raised and get the credit for it and you'll be left with nothing. So I'm glad you didn't get elected too. Mm -hmm. So that was the atmosphere I had. And if you want to know my honest feel, I really didn't care whether I was elected or not. Really? No, I didn't care. Because I had run in 1974, my bishop told me to run, which I thought was a crime. <laughs> I was like in my mid, mid 40s, I think at the time. And uh, I went on and did it because he demanded I do it. Some of the bishops chastised me in private after that. And I told them why I did it. And they told me, well, we understand now. But we were disappointed when we saw your name on that ballot. Oh, wow. So I felt all right about it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 82, I'll let Bishop Lake go in now. But before we get to 82, Bishop Gilmore, Bishop Lakey, talk, we talk about politics and spirituality. Talk about what was going on in the church 
between yeah. 78 and 82. And I know that would be uh, a five hour exposition on that, but just briefly, you yeah. know, what was happening in the church that prompted us to move to this yeah. call general conference? The Bishop Gilmore and I had a classmate named Weldon uh, Crowley from Texas, remember him, Marshall? And uh, you, when, you, when you met him in the morning, you say, how you doing, Weldon? He say, how much time you got? So. <laughs> So when you ask <laughs> what was going on in 78, how much time you got, because uh, it, it was it was some uh, good times in the church. It, it really be uh, the, the, the formation of it, uh, the impetus, I should say, started in 74. When it became evident after that election that the time was coming when the younger, uh, younger bit should be elected. And those in four were uh, Marshall Gilmore, uh, Richard Bass, James Cummings. Uh, uh, that, 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 and I was behind them. I was not in that group. And so, so that was the, 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 the impetus going into 78. And to my surprise, uh, Marshall Gilmore really was the he won't agree with this. He was the popular favorite, not the political favorite, but the popular favorite because everybody knew and really appreciated uh, the work of Marshall Gilmore. But the politics were not quite there. And I think partially because, uh, as he indicated, uh, B Bishop Henry C. Bunton uh, was seeking to be recalled or to be, uh, keep, keep being bishop. And so he was not a political player. But given that background, uh, it was clear that the Joe Johnson, the Chester Kirkendall uh, wings of the church were in competition. And the uh, Bishop Kirkendall, I should say Lane College wing, uh, was supporting James Cummings. And uh, th th that, that was one side. Uh, the other, the Joe Johnson wing was supporting Marshall Gilmore and Richard Bass. Uh, when we got to the general conference, it became evident that uh, the fourth district was 100% behind Marshall Gilmore but was a little hesitant on Richard Bass. It also became evident that the, uh, the, the, the Kirkendall wing was 100% behind uh, James Cummings and that the Georgia contingent, your good Georgians, uh, Dr. Mason, were with their favorite son, Nathaniel Lindsay. Well, Bishop Joseph C. Coles, was not a political, and he bragged about not being politically oriented. He was opposed to Nathaniel Lindsay. And I think I can say this now that both have gone on to glory. He was, he was not in favor of Bishop Lindsay. So he would not uh, support Bishop Lindsay for the Georgians. Well, as you know, Georgians, uh, even if they don't like you, if you're from Georgia, uh, it, they want to support you. And they were the leadership of Georgia was supporting uh, Nathaniel Lindsay and Marshall Gilmore. When we got to the general conference, it became evident that Richard Bass was not going to be able to get the votes, that Marshall Gilmore was going to be a favorite, and James Cummings. But when the issue came to a head, Bishop uh, Bishop uh, Coles would not support. Bishop Cummings. And so Bishop Johnson then decided to try to elect Marshall Gilmore to support Nathaniel Lindsay. What that did politically was it put all of the support from the Bishop Johnson had behind Nathaniel Lindsay, but it did not pick up any support for Bishop Gilmore. And so that meant that uh, because of that, that situation, 
but Bishop Lindsay outpolled Marshall Gilmore. And he also, and James Cummings, had enough support to get elected. But as uh, Bishop Gilmore and I discussed after it was over, we, we kind of believed that God was in that one because it, it worked out that his not being elected uh, resounded to Bishop Gilmore's, I think, benefit. And, and frankly, and honestly, I think to the benefit of the church. I think had Marshall Gilmore gotten elected in 78, there would have been an entirely new dynamic in the church. And what came to be in 82, a, 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 a very forceful change in the direction direction of the church might not have happened. So, and, and, and then of course, we know what happened after 78 was when, uh, that was when I was getting ready to try to offer myself. And of course, Bishop Gilmore was going to go in as the leading candidate. And then of course, uh, William H. Graves was in the wings. Lo and behold, uh, and this will come up when we talk about 82, Bishop Kirby died and then Bishop Johnson died. And well, then the, a whole new dynamic was in play. Wow, that's a lot to yeah. happen. Yeah, in, in that period of time. So leading up to, to 82, Bishop, uh, both of you, what, what was the, the issue regarding the general conference and, and, and the need was it, I think I read that the bishops had not called a general conference, the official call. Can you provide some clarity to what happened and why they had to wait till they got to the general conference? They had to use delegates from seven to eight uh, and then uh, approve the new delegates. I mean, what, what was really going on, Bishop Lake and Bishop Gilmore? I'm going to let Bishop Lake handle that one because I remember it, but I don't remember the detail of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, Jim Charles Thomas once, he was secretary of the General Conference and uh, got a big uproar. And the chair said, Mr. Chairman, where are we? And Jim Charles Thomas said, Mr. Chairman, we're in a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, leading up to that uh, uh, 82 General Conference, uh, uh, we, we were in a mess. What, what actually happened was the 78 General Conference uh, uh, said that the the general conference would be called would be set between June fifteenth and I think July fifteenth. That was when the general conference said the general conference was to be set. Heretofore, it had been set the second week in May or something like that. Well, the bishops set the date of the joint conference for for may rather than june as the discipline stipulated so when they and they elected delegates for the may meeting to meet in may well, when they got to the joint conference it, it could not be held as a joint conference because the discipline said it had to be in june and so the only way they could make it legal was to make it a call general conference. So the general conference was called to order as a call general conference. So it, wait a minute, Bishop Lakey. The last time we had a call conference was in 1873. There you go. It's the only time we'd had a call general conference. So, right. the, so the 82 general conference began as a call general conference. I because see. the bishops did not use the correct date. And the only way they could have made it legal in May was to make it a call general conference. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, this was from legal advice, Leonard B. B. Brady was the attorney. So they, when we got there, it was a call general conference and they had to call the roll of the previous general conference as a call general conference to make it legal. And then when it was a legal general conference, as a call general conference, then the general conference voted, legally voted, that it would become the 82 general conference. And uh, those of us 
who would have challenged that were delegates, or were, were candidates. <laughs> so we kept our mouths shut. So you had to keep your mouth closed. Yeah, keep our mouth closed. <laughs> because I remember a time when a Marshall Gilmore and Oakley Lake and a whole bunch of guys would have been on the floor challenging that authority, but we let it go because we wanted yeah. to make the position. But that was really what happened. So the motion was that the uh, uh, general conference that was called would become the right. regular general conference and seat the delegates who had been elected for that general conference. In a nutshell, that, that's how I read it. Is that way you read it, Bishop Gilmore? Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Well, well, wow, that's a lot. That, that gave me a headache just thinking about <laughs> you having to do all of that just to call the conference into the session. So let, let's talk about now with social media and, and other things, candidates are able to get out uh, in a way uh, unlike any that we've probably seen or witnessed. What was it like for you all? I mean, were you, and I know you don't use the term campaigning, you're an aspirant. You know, and I know, and Bishop Lakey has written a number of articles I've read in some old Christian indexes about the election of the Episcopacy, the sacredness of it, and other bishops as well. But but Bishop Gilmore, what were you doing? Did you campaign? Did you send out letters, flyers? Did you shake hands and kiss the babies? I mean, what was it like in 82? You know, we know they knew you, but did you have to campaign, if you will, for lack of a better term, to get yourself out? Well, my whole candidacy changed in 82. I got more telephone calls from across the church from retired preachers, a lot of them who were also delegates in 82. But I campaigned. Most of mine was uh, through correspondence, letters, members of my congregation who were annual conference officers sent letters out to the delegates on my behalf. The lay leader was a member, Orrin West, the missionary president, Vest Habana, and they sent letters to delegates supporting my campaign, and my candidacy, I should say. And so I did not do a lot of traveling because I didn't have a lot of money. I mean, so I had to do the best I could with what I had. Now, the city of Dayton, and I have a, a magazine here with an article in it. I just found it a few weeks ago where they get a, did a banquet for me at the convention center. And back in 82, I think they cleared around six or $7,000 and gave it to the treasurer of the campaign organization. And uh, when I got elected, I had about four or five thousand of the six that was cleared because I didn't do a lot of traveling. I didn't do a lot. I drove most of the places I went. I flew to Oklahoma, I remember, and Texas and Louisiana. But by and large, I did not do a lot of traveling because I simply couldn't afford it. And my bishop, going up to 82, had been, first of all, Bishop Blake, I mentioned him. And Bishop James Cummins came came after the 72 general conference, 78 general conference. And he was a very good supporter of mine. When we had the banquet, he was in California, but he came back and was a speaker for it and supported me through my election. He stayed in contact with me almost every week. And when Bishop Cummins sp spoke, on my behalf in places meant, meant a lot. Mm -hmm. But I, like Bishop Lincoln mentioned Bishop Coles, I never considered myself a very good politician in the church. <laughs> I had to kind of depend on uh, other people. And Bishop Lincoln knows I had a strong detractor in my own conference. And he, he raised money to keep me from getting elected. Oh, my. And every year when we had the annual conference, he'd have a big dinner for a bunch of the delegates. Mm -hmm. And then when I did get elected in 82, and Bishop come in with my bishop, our bishop, we met at Trinity in Indianapolis, our first meeting. And I was going down to the lower level of the church 
that morning and met this gentleman, and he bragged about giving some of the candidates in 78 a thousand dollars. And he asked me to, he says, will you speak to the old man and tell him I want to be on the joint board? I said, you didn't give me a thousand dollars, so ask that bishop you gave. <laughs> I said, ask him. So Bishop come and spent about 40 minutes talking about me down in the little level of that church that morning. Yeah. Because both of us had served a young years in some way under Bishop Bell. Mm-hmm. And uh, Bishop come and made it clear to them, to that group that morning at Trinity, that we all were sons of Bishop Bell. And we were going to support each other. And made it clear he was going to support me. But this preacher spent so much money trying to keep me off the delegation. And that's something. But Bishop Lake came to be his bishop later. I won't talk to that. Spit <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, bishop Gilmore is uh, keep in keeping with his personality is unduly modest. I, I see his election a little differently. I, I see Marshall Gilmore uh, having secured his place when we all gathered in the early 70s at the new church in Dayton that Marshall Gilmore had built. And I think it was decided when all the bishops and all of us walked into the new Phillips Temple in Dayton that Marshall Gilmore was really elected bishop then. It was just a matter of waiting until the time for the votes to be cast. Uh, uh, I know he did his campaigning his way, but it, it, it was an odds on uh, known fact that in 82, Marshall Gilmore was gonna be elected bishop. The, the issue was, who were going to be at that time, the other three. Because we all knew Marshall Gilmore was going to be elected. So the question was, he going to be Graves, Lakey, Bass, Broomfield, or Isom? Those were the questions being raised. There was no question about Marshall Gilmore. And his, quote, campaigning, such as he did, was for folk to get to see and know this Marshall Gilmore, the who had done such a great work in the church. So that's how I saw him going into. And another thing Bishop Gilmore did that uh, I thought put him in, in the best favors. And in, in 1970, we went, what was it, Mount Olive uh, Cathedral in Memphis when Bishop uh, Bertram W. Doyle was up for retirement. And Marshall Gilmore got on the floor and was uh, arguing that Bishop B.W. Doyle should not be retired, he should be retained. And after he made his speech, a whole lot of uh, Bishop Gilmore's friends went to him and said, you made a political mistake. A person like Amos Rice, who had fought hard for the retirement law, said this was a mistake for for Marshall Gilmore to defend Bishop Doyle. But the upshot of it was, and this was his positive, that Marshall Gilmore showed loyalty to his bishop, even to the possible peril of his own Episcopal aspirations. But it wow. was, his, it was his, his willingness, his courage to defend his bishop in that situation that endeared uh, hit him into the hearts and minds of a lot of us. So that really helped Marshall Gilmore. And then too, what we may want to, and you, and you can't take things out of their historical context. Mm-hmm. Historical context was that, uh, re- remember now that uh, at that time, those of us with top-notch theological education were a rarity. And at that time, a degree, uh, see, when we, when, when we were in school, 
there was no IT, there was no Phillips School of Theology that was accredited. And those of us who were blessed by the church to attend the, uh, the, the, the major theological schools were put in a, in a higher category in the church because the church at that time needed first class theologically trained leaders. And so those of us who were able to go to Drew and to Boston and to Isle uh, uh, and to Howard, th those had an advantage because the church really was searching because we had to compete with these other denominations and their leaders were highly trained theologically and the CME church wanted to be sure that its leadership could measure up to the academic leadership of the other denominations. So uh, the, the fact that most of us had gone to these uh, theological schools at that time was a tremendous advantage. Well, I want you in a few minutes, both you and, and Bishop Gilmore to talk about how you met because it was in that setting that you all met each other uh, in seminary. But I wanna hear your story, Bishop Lakey. Uh, you, you've described in the history book that you wrote yourself as a dark horse candidate, quote unquote. Um, and I've heard others say that uh, Bishop Lakey, when he was editor to the Christian Index, he wrote himself into the Episcopacy uh, based on just the, the, the level of the, the articles, some controversial, uh, some on point, uh, but all, all intriguing to say the least. So you, you consider yourself an, an, an underdog, a, a, or maybe not an underdog, maybe a dark horse candidate, but, but why so? And, and did, was your bishop supporting you? And I guess the larger question, can you run for bishop in this church? And I guess you can, and not have your Episcopal leaders support you uh, and hope to get elected? Well, uh, here, here's the way it was. <laughs> it was no secret that I was a protege of Norris Samuel Curry. And it was understood, I think by all that, had Norris Curry uh, lived, that I would be uh, right into the Episcopacy on his coattails. I think that was generally understood. Uh, but, but so when I was elected editor, I followed the tradition of editors up to that point, where I considered the editorship to be a, a platform to speak what I felt to be uh, truth to power. Mm -hmm. Whatever I felt I wanted to say to the church, I felt that was my job to say it. And so I wrote what I felt. And in fact, I was praised on one side and condemned on the other for things I said. In fact, Bishop Murchison pulled me aside once and said, Lakey, you ought to stop writing all that stuff you write. You ought not to do that for the church. That's bad for the church. Well, you don't argue with bishops. So what I did was went and got some of Bishop Murchison's articles when he was editor and printed some of his articles, which were worse than mine. And after that, <laughs> after that, Bishop Murchison didn't, didn't have anything else to say to me. Because up to that point, editors did what I was doing. Okay. So, so that was what I was doing. But also as editor, you get to know the church. You go to uh, most of the annual conferences, you shake hands with everybody. So I got to know everyone. But what happened politically, I was a dark, dark horse, that was your question, was that Norris Curry died. And of course, that was my mentor. Well, at the grave in Los Angeles, at his graveside, as we were getting ready to leave his grave, Bishop Johnson came up to me, put his arms around me and said, Lakey, you're my boy now. And that made me feel, well, I, I have a supporter. Lo and behold, three months later, Bishop Johnson died. Oh my goodness. So I had no visible Episcopal support, but it so happened that the legacy of Norris Curry and the legacy of Joe Johnson was strong enough so that when the time came in 82, I had enough momentum that I was able to, uh, 
maintain the support they had given me. It so happened that the bishop I was under at the time was in a different political uh, camp, so to speak. And I don't hold it against him because that was where the church was. And, uh, and, and so he was not supportive of me. But it so happened that I was able to counter that because when you, when you get to know people and, and this is the advantage of being editor. See, I wasn't like Bishop Gilmore and Bishop Graves and Bishop Isom, they, and they won't admit it, but they could invite bishops to preach in their churches and they'd give them honorarium and stuff. All I had was the Christian index. And it, you know, I, you know, it doesn't hurt to put the bishop's picture on the front cover and you know, that little stuff like that. <laughs> so I, I did use the index a little bit. My motto was, or my feeling was, for the first, the, it, 70, 82, the first two years I wrote for the church. Don't, don't tell anybody, Dr. Mason. The last, the last two years I wrote for me. If that's, if I can make, <laughs> since I'm 86 years old, I can make that confession now. You can make that confession, make now. That confession now. That I, I, I thought, so, so you would do things. You, if a, if a strong leader of a denomination of the, of a district wrote, wrote an article, good or bad, you put yeah. it in the Christian index. That kind right. of thing. Right. Right. Wow. Uh, uh, Joan, you can unmute your dad. I had to unmute uh, Bishop. We were getting a little feedback from. Um, uh, from the computer, but she can unmute you, Bishop Gilmore, because I want to ask both you and Bishop Lakey. Let me send her a quick text. Okay. I want to ask both you and Bishop Lakey. Uh, now I want to talk about the day that you all were uh, elected. Um, and I think you all were elected on different days, if, if I read correctly the first uh, ballot going into the wee hours of the morning. Um, I think there may have been some drama because Bishop Lakey, your name was omitted from the first ballot. Who on earth would do that? What was that all about? And uh, then getting elected. Um, Bishop Gilmore, ask Joan to come and unmute you, uh, please, so you can chime in. I just sent a text. But Bishop Lakey, why uh, he's getting uh, Joan? What do you remember about that first ballot? That I mean, I, well, I, let me I, back I, up for a second because I understand that for the first time in history, you all were able to present yourself or introduce yourself. Yeah. Well, well see, uh, see, this this is why it was so historic. For the first time, we had a printed ballot for the election of bishops. And for the first time, candidates or aspirants were able to present themselves or introduce themselves to the general conference. So the 82 general conference was historic in that sense. And so we had to, uh, at a certain point, go write our names, put our names in to be on the printed ballot. Mm -hmm. and that was back in the days of the uh, mimeograph machine. Right. And they had to cut a stencil. So we had to sign in so they could put our names the way we wanted on the printed on ballot. The ballot. Right. So so that, that was that was the process. So we all went up, sign in, and then they went back and printed the ballot. And then when time came for the election, they were ready to pass out the ballots. Mm -hmm. And so what happened, the, the process was. We all went up front, and the, and the secretary was reading the ballot, was calling the names of those on the ballot. And when your name was called, you bowed, you didn't say anything, you just waved your hand or you bowed and then went to your seat. Well, he went down the line, and the name ahead of me, I think, was Jones. And the next name would have been me and then Anzo Montgomery. And when the secretary said Jones, and I think Kelsey Jones uh, bowed and went to his seat. And then he said Anzo Montgomery. And Montgomery bowed and went to his seat. And then the secretary said, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Lake's name has been left off the ballot. 
Mm. And Lord have mercy. I'm sure there was a hush in that room, huh? <laughs> yeah, there was, a, there was a hush in the room, and I think it was a hush in my heart too. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. Uh, and so then, in, so so then he called. So then he called my name, and then I took my bow and went and went to my seat. And then they finished the, the roll call. Yes. And then uh, the, the the chair, Bishop Exum, was presiding. The chair asked me, did I want them to write my name or did I want a new ballot? He asked me. Okay. And that was on the spur of the moment. That was a difficult decision. On the one hand, I realized the, the delegation was ready to vote. And I didn't want to be responsible for holding up the vote. On the other hand, emotionally folk would write my name in the first time but i was sure that they would not be writing my name in other time mm -hmm. so i on the spur of the moment made the decision mr chairman i would like for my name to be on the ballot the same as the other person yes and that was the decision they made wow bishop gilmore so uh, and Bishop Lakey, you've alluded to it. So this was the days where they counted each ballot one one sheet at a time. And one, I guess they one, had one, ba one ballot, uh, one one ballot one at a time. I guess they had tellers at that time they were called. Tellers? Uh -huh. Yeah. That was a long process. Very long process. Very but an long. exciting process. But uh, Oh, I can say, imagine. You say so Lakey you, won, Gilmore won, Graves right. two. That was a tremendous thing. So Bishop Gilmore, you 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 get the number of, of, of votes. What what happens then? Uh, were they lifting you up eventually and carrying you to the to the stage? You know, did all of that? Because I can't find any photos of it. I mean, you you would think this was in the 1800s. This was just in 1982. So I don't know why I can't find any uh, photos uh, of that. But did they lift you, uh, lift you all up and carry you to the stage as we they do now? Right, there were people gathering around me. Okay. When they saw that I was drawing near, because in that general conference, I got seventy-five percent of the vote, and so they saw I had a momentum going, and they began to come around me. And when I got the number of votes, they picked me up, carried me up on the stage, and. It's interestingly enough to me, it was the day before Joan's birthday. As Bishop Blake said, it was in May, and it was on the 8th of May, and when I was elected. Wow. That is something. Bishop Blake, your 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 moment when you finally get yes. past the number. In fact, I wish I had known. I have a copy of my, somebody had a copy of me being uh, me lifted up. So I, I could well, have, have sent that to me. I yeah, to I can you. still add it. Okay. Um, but what happened was Bishop Gilmore and Bishop Graves were elected around what about, about almost midnight, Bishop Gilmore? Almost midnight, yeah. Almost midnight. Well, when they when they finished the balloting and th those two were elected and they'd given all the accolades, I was 44 votes short. Wow. And at the time, uh, I wanted them to have another election because I had learned a long time ago that once you dismiss bishops get together and well, you don't know what's going to happen after that. So I, wanted, so I wanted them to have another ballot, but it was it was too late. So they had to dis, to dismiss and I had to go to bed 44 votes short. I thought that was bad until I talked to Bishop Gilmore and he said in 78, he was a few votes short. And he had to spend four years. I had to spend overnight. <laughs> that was 22 votes short. You, you were Are you kidding? 22? In 78, yes. He, he was wow. 22 votes. He had to wait four years. And I was 44 votes short and I had to wait overnight. But yeah. anyway, that was that, that was how I felt. And I didn't know I was elected bishop on Jones' birthday because the next day was Mother's Day. May That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and so, uh, and it was, it was something to go to bed 
And, uh, and you, you know, I didn't get much sleep. And then to, to, to wake up, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but uh, the, the phone rang in our room at, at six o'clock. Mm -hmm. And the wife of one of our uh, delegates, my good friends in Texas, said, spoke to Narcissus and said, honey, I hate to tell you this, but uh, Bishop's wife been on the phone all night long telling folk not to vote for your husband. So that was wow. that was the first news. Oh, my goodness. At, at six o'clock that morning, you know, that was that was kind of rough. So we, we, we went on to the to the to the place and it yeah. was Mother's Day and we had to go to the Mother's Day service and Bishop Coles was scheduled to preach. And, okay. the, and the service, the business session didn't start until after lunch that afternoon. Right. Right. So they, and then they resume. Yeah. What was the momentum kind of taken? You know, when you carry it over to another day, is the excitement? Does it resume once the ballots is counting? You know. Um, well, I, I felt that I don't know how Bishop Gilmore felt because I know he he was in, in second heaven then because he he was Bishop. He had been elected, right? He, he stood up on the stage and stuff, yeah. and he got up trying to get trying to get elected, and um, I, I felt that the momentum picked back up. Good. But during the night, some politics had been played and some efforts were being made, I learned later, to right. block my election. Yeah. And so when it started again, because when it, when it ended, if I remember correctly, it was Lakey, Broomfield, and Bass, and Isom. That was the order in which we closed out. That was... So when we resumed, it became apparent that the forces that were had lined up behind Bishop Ison mm -hmm. and Bishop Broomfield. And I think Bishop, uh, eventually Bishop uh, Bass. And, and my name was not supposed to be called. And so when the balloting started, it, it, it became a, a, a sort of between Bishop Ison and myself and Bishop Isom uh, prevailed ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And here I'm wondering, is that, are they gonna run short? And this is how things work, Dr. Mason. I was sitting there as they were giving Bishop Isom his accolades. I was sitting there wondering, do they have enough votes left for me to get elected? Right. And um, I remember, I think Daryl, Daryl Coleman was helping count the ballots. Okay. And while they were doing Bishop Isom, he looked through the remaining ballots and came to me and said, Dr. Lakey, you have enough votes to get elected. Oh, wow. So when they resumed the counting, though I was still anxious, I had been told yeah. I had enough votes to get elected. Yeah. And when I got elected, when I got the numbers, they say they gathered around me. Ed Stone was sitting next to me. He said, Lakey, we carrying you up in your chair. So they picked up Bishop Gilmore and they, they picked him up bodily. My crowd picked me up in my chair. In a chair? In the chair. And they, they carried me up. I'm sitting in my chair. And I shouldn't say this on your uh, program, but somebody said, I heard you say, that Negro carrying this throne with him. <laughs> <laughs> And so that's how that's how I was carried to the carried to the platform. Oh, wow. and, and, and 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 this is the irony of it. Uh Bishop uh, Kirkendall and Bishop Coleman, this is our system, were the first bishops to greet me when I was oh. taking the stage. So that's our system. Wow. That's special. Well, with I mean, this this class obviously once elected gained notoriety. Uh there were five of you all. Uh and you all went on to to lead uh, your Episcopal districts and to, to make your mark. Three of your classmates are no longer with us, but the spirit and legacy continues to live on. You've seen a lot in the church over the last 40 years. And what a blessing that in 2022 that you are able to to share those, those memories uh, and also to be a part of the changing dynamics of the church. I would like to ask you. Uh, by have some closing thoughts 
uh, about what, what what have you seen throughout these 40 years uh, and how do you feel? And this may be a loaded question, and, uh, but, you know, are you pleased with the direction that the church has gone and is going? I mean, you, you look at it, you know, from a different lens than, than most of us. Uh, Bishop Gilmore, let's start with you. Just give us your thoughts about the church and uh, what you've seen and where it's going. And then you, Bishop Lakey. I think the world has changed so tremendously since we were elected. It's much faster. I think social media has done a lot. I see a lot of things being done now that I really didn't have the opportunity to do it. Take a simple, it's not simple in a sense, but when there are deaths in our church, you know it right immediately. We had to do it on telephone, I asked that letter. One of the things I think has happened too, I think when we were elected in 82, most of us had worked very closely with bishops. And so there was a continuity in a way in what we were attempting to do from time to time. That I don't, I'm not sure that that continues. Uh, we had been kind of in the know, so to speak, of what was going on in the church, and that helped a lot. But one of the things I also noticed in the last general conference, when I got the list of delegates in the book, I knew so few of them, but I've been retired 16 years. That's a long time. And I didn't know a lot of the people that I saw in the delegation from the districts I presided over, which was the fourth and eighth. And yet I feel pretty good about where the church is going because I think the church is, uh, has always been impacted by what's happening in the world. And I think we were looked upon as a dream team when we were elected and we had some projects. Bishop Blakey got the hymn that the church has and I think was a major step in our church. And I thought that was a very good move on the part of the church. I hate to say this, but one of the things we discovered later that the hymnals hadn't been paid for. Mm. And that wasn't the people's fault. It was the leader's fault. Mm -hmm. They appointed me to collect the money to pay. I found that the publishing house that did it wasn't owned by the National Baptist Convention. They gave me a name to call, and he turned out to be a white fellow. Oh, my. And uh, I told him what I, my job was, and he, he greeted me with it and was appreciative. And the bishops paid for the hymn, I think it was $143,000. They sent to me, which I sent to him to, to pay for the hymnals. Mm -hmm. But he had led in that project, which wasn't easy because of copyrights and all that kind of thing. And I felt very good that we were able to, I think, provide the church with some things. I, I decided to uh, do the Book of Ritual. Mm -hmm. And the bishops got behind that. And so did the William George when he was general secretary of uh, published the publications in the church. He provided a large one and got all the copyrights, I think, that we use in there because most of that, what I did was edit, not write. Mm -hmm. And he did a tremendous job, George did, in getting that. So I thought, and then Bishop Graves led in getting the headquarters in Memphis. I was very happy when he called me about that. And we went and looked at it, and he moved forward with it. I I feel good about the church then. I feel good about it now. I think I worry more about what has happened since the pandemic. Are we going to really get back in our churches the way we were before? Mm -hmm. Only time will tell that, I'm sure. Yeah. But 
I have no real regrets about what's happening or what we did. I think our leaders did a good job. The bishops who we elected in 82, I think they all did a very excellent job. Because the thing I found when I got elected bishop, I told this many times to people, when I was a pastor, I felt I could solve my problems. But with a bishop, I didn't. Mm. I had a presiding elder one time, when W.C. Crenshaw was his name, and he used to say, the thing you have to learn to do in the church is hold your nose and keep on going. Mm. Or you get stinky sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I found that to be true in the church. And as a bishop, you find you just can't do some of the things you want to do because you have to have the people with you. And sometimes they don't see it as you see it. Bishop Allen used to say, J. Claude Allen, who did more for me than I know anybody. But Bishop Allen used to say, if you can see more from where you are than I can see from up here, then you ought to be up here and ought to be down there. But you oh, can see it, it doesn't mean you could do it. And a lot of things that you want to do in the church as a bishop, you just have to buy the time. Yeah, and we can pray that you can get it done. Get it done. Before we get to Bishop Lakey, tell us about your friendship with Bishop Lakey. Y'all have known each other long. Well, <laughs> I won't repeat something my wife said about that. <laughs> <laughs> but we met before day in the morning with the heart bound on. That's heart bound, yes. I I'd gotten there. And I was uh, unloading my things out of my little old car. I had a 1949 Ford back in those days that I bought when I was, uh, my brother bought it. And uh, then he bought a second car and gave me the first one. And I paid him some money on that. But I was making a, move, a trip into the dorm. And uh, Bishop Lake, I believe, was coming out. And I was going in. It wasn't just the opposite. The opposite. I was coming out. Coming out, and he was going in, in the door, and we met in the door. Two o'clock. Two o'clock in the morning. I'd driven up there from, uh, well, I started in Augusta, Georgia, because I was pastoring that summer, filling in for one of the pastors who's gone on now. But anyway, we greeted each other. And discovered right off, he knows it better than I do it now, that we were both CMEs. And doing those three years we were there, I think we were only CMEs in the mm -hmm. yeah. seminary. Yeah. But I'll let you tell him because he knows that story. My wife, she she can't hear you in that bishop. Yeah. What 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 Bishop Gilmore is referring to is uh, Yvonne says she's heard this story so many times. If she hears it again, she's going to pull her dress tail up over her head. That's what she said. So we don't tell it in front of her anymore. But what he's saying is true. I, I had traveled all the way from uh, uh, Pasco, Washington, to California by conference, to Madison, New Jersey, and arrived uh, at the train station. And a couple on campus carried me to the dorm. And, and and when I got to the dorm, the door opened, and there this young man standing there getting ready to come out. I said, uh, hello, I'm Othel Lakey from a CME from California. He said, oh, I'm Marshall Gilmore, a CME from Buffman, North Carolina. So we met, and I don't know why we mentioned we were CME at 2 o'clock in the morning meeting. We've been friends ever since. and and, and and Marshall, Mr. Gilmore was really almost like an older brother. Now I had an older brother who was six years older than me, but because I was a young preacher, he didn't treat me like an older brother. He treated me like a preacher. So he didn't he didn't carry me to the to the to the clubs. He didn't tell me about girls. He what older brothers tell young brothers. Right, he, right. He, he told my he told my brother Lawrence all that stuff. He wouldn't tell me anything. So, so Marshall kind of helped me learn the ropes a little bit as, as an older brother as we moved through the church. 
Uh, but what, everything he said was, uh, of course, accurate. About that hymnal, what happened was, when, I, uh, we, when they gave us our, our assignments as bishops over committees, boards, bishop, they didn't give me a, a, a board. They made me vice chair of the board of Christian education under Bishop Cummings. When Bishop Cummings died, I became chair of the board of Christian education, but Bishop Cummings was also chair of the hymnal commission. So I inherited that responsibility. And I looked through what Bishop Cummings had done for the hymnal, went to the general conference and reported that we didn't have the resources to do a hymnal. And the general conference ordered that we do the hymnal anyway. So that's how we wound up doing it the way we did it. And what Bishop Gilmore said was so true. The, the, the church agreed, the bishop agreed, we would print 25,000 at $10 each to pay for it. But somehow the, uh, the payment didn't get made. We sold them and got the money. And well, we had some problems, but we, we couldn't do what we wanted to do because of some of those things. But all that we tried to do, and by the, by the way, that dream team name, you know where that came from? Where did it come from? It, it came in, in, in the 125th anniversary, in 1995 it was. Uh, it was during the O.J. Simpson trial. We had the celebration. And they had a lady doing something about the church. And she was going through the history. When she got to our class, she said, and then we elected the dream team. So she equated our that's where we got the name from, our class with the Johnny Cochran uh, law firm. That's where that uh, dream team okay. came from. She I labeled us with that. We never called ourselves that. We didn't do it. That right, Mark? That's right. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's good. That's a great, great anecdote and story. I often wonder where that name came from. That's where the name came from. Yeah. Well, you know, lastly, we elected, ironically, five new bishops. That number five again, uh, just a few months ago, and now they are they are serving uh, and and leading uh, their e Episcopal districts. Uh, and I know, perhaps you all look back now and in your mind you you have some idea of what they're going through you know and do, do do you offer advice to new bishops if they ask well only if they ask. yeah <laughs> yep. you don't you don't you don't volunteer advice to bishop you have to right um uh, i don't know how bishop gilmore feels but i felt very comfortable for the church with the class of 22. Uh, the kinship I see is that the, the 22 class as the 82 class were all primarily pastors. Mm -hmm. That is, when I say that, I mean pastors together, which provides a, a relationship and a kinship that's meaningful for the church they all really look at it pretty much from the same perspective. And I think that aided, helped us a little bit as we move forward. We all knew what, what, what the church really needed from a pastoral point of view. And we were all friends. And, and all friends. I was very happy with the class of 2022. I was very pleased and I had two of them to call me and one of them to speak to me after he finished this is the conference after his election. Oh, wow. But I really feel good about that class. And sometimes you may want to see somebody else elected, but that doesn't mean that you don't like the ones who were elected. And that's the way I was about this class. Yes, I, thought, I thought all five of them, I, I don't know the one of them that well. I read the letter to Bishop uh, Reddick wrote about him later and he looked like a very able person to help the church also but i felt very good about this class yes yeah. well that is that is great bishop lakey and bishop gilmore you all are just um 
like our Episcopal jewels, uh, um, treasures in this church. Uh, we thank God for your longevity. Uh, we thank God for the contributions that you have made, not only leading your Episcopal district, but uh, as authors and scholars, the books that you have written, the articles that you have written. Uh, and this church is, is the better because of, of the two of you. And we thank God for your longevity of friendships as well. And I thank you for spending some time with me uh, on this afternoon, uh, on this conversation as we look back to years on this uh, dream team, the class of 82 uh, with Bishop Opelake and Bishop Marshall Gilmore. Uh, and we certainly say the names of Bishop uh, William Graves, Bishop Dacia Isom, uh, and Bishop Ori Broomfield as well, members of the dynamic uh, Episcopal class of 1982. Thank God for you. May God continue to bless you and, and your families. Uh, and uh, let me thank uh, my dear sister, Joan, uh, who has really become a good friend. Uh, you'd be surprised sometime during my show, we're texting each other, uh, mm -hmm. particularly when I have some folks who get a little uh, hot tempered or, well, this was during the candidates time we were doing some things, but she has really been a good friend. I'm grateful for her as well. And we thank you so much for the time that you spent with me today. And may God continue to bless you. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And, and your member, Dr. Lakey says, uh, she's going to get her tithes and offering to you as soon as she gets your address. <laughs> let, let me tell you, Dr. Elfrida Lakey uh, is a blessing to West Mitchell Street. Uh, Bishop Gilmore, you remember that little church in Atlanta called West Mitchell Street, don't you? Oh, yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to hear the story about that one. We don't have time to tell it now, but it yeah, well, he shared he shared it with me, okay. and uh, we 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 love him. Uh, even if his tenure was short at West Mitchell Street, he is very much a part of the the history and Lord there. But thank God for you all. Uh, you all take care uh, and uh, continue blessings to to both of you. Thank you. God. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't that wonderful? Thank you so much, Bishop Lakey and Bishop Gilmore for sharing uh, with us today. And I look forward to continuing these conversations. Uh, my next conversation will be in September, so be on the lookout for that. Thank you, Dr. Duhart, and the continued support of this wonderful church. As we close out, I want to close out with a brief selection, Draw Me Nearer by my cousin, Dr. Morja Roberson, who just completed his uh, PhD uh, in music at Harvard University and is now at Emory. Won't you enjoy this uh, a cappella rendition of Draw Me Near? Be blessed, go in love, and go in peace. I am thine, O Lord, and I've heard thy voice. And it told thy love to me But I long to rise In the arms of faith And be closer drawn, drawn to thee Draw me nearer Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to Thy precious. It is precious to thy precious bleeding side.